Can you all hear me? I'm the oldest man in the room. But that's not a feature. My feature, I have a pretty big mouth. So, okay. <laughs> Hope you can all hear. So I can forget about the, the, the mic. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm very, very honored to be here. And uh, uh, for a month, in fact, I was here for, for more than 10 days. I've been so well taken care of. It's, it's really, very grateful for me to be able to give you a report. I can, we, we heard a lot of technical, very highly technical stuff today. Mine will be totally simple, very elementary. You hardly will see a few symbols and I hardly will see a formula at all, okay? And so it's just my thoughts. In fact, somebody says, some, your random thoughts, I don't know, not quite random, but the thoughts on Bayesian approach, on random in fact models, panel data, and so on, okay? The title is a bit strong, it's a bit long, but I'm sorry about that, okay? And so, so I, will, I will sit down. Would it be all right if I sit down and talk? Sure. Thank you. So here's a, here's a talk, and the talk has two co-authors. One is a speaker this morning, he did a very good job, I think. Uh, Professor Wei, uh, uh, Hong Wei Chang. Oh, where's Hong Wei? <laughs> the co-author, he has worked very hard with me, especially since I got here about 10 days ago, okay? And another one is uh, Mr. Wang Chen Chung from Beijing University, he's a, uh, he, he has been with me for about two months in my house in the last two months. So we've also worked on, on one of the data sets that I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about. So first, let me give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about, okay? And then, they're all very simple. I have, let's see, it's about 40 minutes from now. I can talk about 40 minutes. If any time you want me to use the mic, just say it, okay? <clears throat> Here's a brief outline. Now I'll say a little bit about myself, and the, the importance is say a little bit about my teacher. Then I'll tell you a little bit of what I have done in the last uh, uh, 40, 50 years. And then finally I will concentrate. That will probably take care of uh, uh, 10 minutes or so of the, the, the time. And then I will concentrate on what I talk about talk about this random effect model based in shrinkage, which is really something very interesting. And I was doing that quite some, but something like about 40 years ago. And then I tell you my thoughts about the panel data. And in fact, all this Bayesian stuff in marketing, to me, is all panel data. They're all, all nice panels. And especially the Allenby's books, Allenby, Alan B. was with me for about three, four, three to five years in Chicago. He's now the man in marketing for me. <laughs> and uh, he talked about one of his uh, nice data on, on cheese. I'm sure most of you probably know about that. And then also, fortunately, recently we got sort of Professor uh, Zhuang about the Japan scanner data, which I mentioned a little bit. And then finally, I conclude my talk about so something I'm thinking about for what we need to do and so forth in the future, okay? First, just <laughs> tell you my life, okay? I'm 81 year old now, and I was born in England, and, but I was brought up really in China. So I completed high school, finally I completed high school and college in Taiwan, and I uh, went to the United States for further study, and I stayed there ever since work and retirement and all that, okay? You can all see this, right? There's no problem. All right. The most fortunate thing for me is to meet my teacher, Professor George Box, uh, in 1960, uh, really in 1960. It was a, a great luck for me because I think uh, Professor Box is really one of the greatest statisticians in the second half of the 20th century. Okay, because I 
or may the first half be his first half, or the founding fathers, such as Pearson, uh, Naaman, and then Fisher. Okay. And but, so that's all happened. They have great work all done in the early, in the first half of the 20th century, and uh, George's work is do, doing mostly in the second half of, uh, of the 20th century. And I was two years a student at Wisconsin, and then stayed there to teach for 20 years before I moved to Chicago in 1982. I've been in Chicago since. And then the thing, so I was tw his, 20 years his colleagues, and then as a friend ever since, he, until he passed last, basically last year. The thing I learned most from his, from, from, from Box is a great statistician, but the thing I learned most from him is this word. If he says statistics is an indispensable tool for scientific education. So it's a tool. So therefore, how do you develop a good tool? The good tool must know the problem. So therefore, the development of some statistics must go hand in hand with practice. Now, this is an important thing to push. Statistics cannot do without mathematics, but statistics is not mathematics. Statistics really need practice. I think Greg Annaby is a great example of that. He seems practice, practice, practice in marketing. Okay. And he's really a great man in that field now. I'm so happy to see him here and all that. Okay. So I'll say a little bit of my professional work. And that was introduced <laughs> uh, saying that I done, I'm very happy. People still might like my book with George Parks in 1973. Remember, that's 1973 is 40 years, more than 40 years ago. That book was not bad and so forth, but it's far outdated by other things now. And I was uh, in the 60s in the 60 and 70s when I first started out doing academic, being an academic, in the academic profession, I was doing base for about from 61 to about early 70s. And uh, then in the 70s, I got interested in application. The yeah, first major project I was doing is on the Los Angeles air pollution problem. And uh, then I was in that air pollution or, uh, environmental problem for 40 years. The first few years is with uh, Los Angeles Pollution, and then they got into the global ozone problem. The ozone, and people all worry about global warming, including here, everybody. And, and that's what I did. I was in there for about 20, 25, 30, 30 years. So that's, and then, but, but my professional, uh, more sort of um, technical work in statistics is on all on time series. And it uh, has something to do with the the seasonal adjustment, which I report the next week here uh, to the department here, and about mostly it's in the area of univariate and multiple time series in the last 20, 30 years. So that's one main professional thing. And other than this professional work, I was also involved in quite a bit of uh, activities. And uh, I was very lucky to get into the Institute of Statistical Science at the early days in Taiwan, and I was sort of uh, one of the uh, promoter of the establishment of the Institute of Statistical Science. I think they have very close relationship with the Institute of S Statistics and Mathematics, and uh, and also how founded the, the Department of Quantitative Finance in the Tsinghua University in Taiwan, not the one in Beijing. And then also, but I did in Beijing, I sort of helped found the Department of Applied Statistical Department in the Peking University in 2002. And the uh, number of people here, uh, uh, we had a first business uh, academic meeting for that department in, uh, uh, that's what the, uh, Greg was talking about. Uh, okay, that's in 2004. In, in addition to this, I was sort of like a, more or less responsible for the establishment of the International Chinese Statistical Society. And uh, more important is that journal, similar, I think most of you are probably aware of, it's a Statistical Seneca. That, that, was, uh, that was a public started out in 1991, and it's now been uh, pretty popular 
a statistics journal. Okay, so here's some of the R. So now let me just go to the talk about the work. Now, what well, first this is just to make this talk kind of self-consistent. I have to start talking a little bit. Mention that this everybody in the audience knows this is that in this in the in statistics there's been sort of basically two approaches. One is to treat the, so everything as uh, probability of frequency. Another one is treat the probability as a degree of belief. The first is sometimes we call it the frequentist approach, and uh, and then that's so treat the interpret the probability as frequency, and then compare what we have to observe with the data with what could have happened and the review sampling of the model that we use. Then then, then that's a significance. That's for example, it's a. a a simple, simple <coughs> example of that. The other one is the base. Everybody here in the audience is very familiar with this formula, and that's the only formula I'll show you. And uh, this uh, positive distribution, if say that is the parameter one estimate, and why is the data we have, and then the positive distribution is a product of the uh, P theta, which is the prior, we call it a prior distribution, and another one is the PY given say that that's the likelihood. The likelihood will give you all the information that we have at hand from the data. So that's the feature and all that we don't have. But the, say that P theta is what's called the prior distribution. All you can think about is another source of uh, information about the theta. So the, so the basic approach is very simple. It's just a combining both sources of information. information from your data, that's a PY given theta, and the information from uh, from theta is other information. So that's that. So the likelihood of function. And uh, the, um, now if the theta has many parameters, like nowadays people always talk about uh, large P and small N and so forth. Yes, it's, uh, so the theta could be just a few parameters. So if you, you run a regression with the intercept and two or three uh, parameter values. Or it could be what, very, very large, like you have a, a panel of uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of consumers. Okay, each have a few numbers. So, so, so P is much greater than N, okay? So that's the situation. So now, of course, you, you suppose you want to integrate on some of these parameters. That's very hard to do. In principle, you can do it just by this formula, which is like get the marginal distribution. If you integrate out the unneeded parameter, the say say the two. So the so the Bayesian approach really gave you sort of the very very natural formula for updating your, your information by this base formula, combine the, the, the power distribution, which is what you have before the data at hand, when the likelihood. But it has two problems. One is that, what's your prior, what is your prior at the beginning? That's a, uh, that's a thing that we used to fight for years, for years, and for years. And in the literature, it'd be more than 100 years of fighting about what do you mean by some Prior, which doesn't tell you my very much, but but to come to have a complete theory, you have to have that. <laughs> okay, so that's one problem. The second problem. Yeah. So that's so in my at my time at my young at my young time, and this is why I spend lots and lots of time trying to struggle to 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 find the prior, which doesn't tell you very much. Okay. But now, but that's really not a big problem. The big problem is how do you do the high dimension integration? I can assure you, for my years from about 62 when I started to work to about 67, 68, I spent about one third of my time trying to approximate integrals. That's all we do. And so that really handles the, the application of Bayes in marketing. You think about, you have, you have, uh, say, 5,000 or 10,000 or, 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 or half a million customers. How do you get it? You, uh, how do you 
Katha has some idea. Each has some parameters and so forth. How do you get, get to find the estimate of those parameters? That was the problem. But that problem, unfortunately, is when I left the profession, left the Bayesian stuff in the, in the late 70s, 80s, and then the MCMC come. And that solved the problem ever since. So now it's a completely different world. I think, in a way, it's a completely different world in, in computing and in, in solving a lot of problems we have. It's this MCMC, which I don't have to talk about. Okay. So now, what I want to now the rest of the time, I still have like about what uh, twenty minutes or so. So I will talk a little bit about this uh, hierarchical models, which is sort of uh, allow us to do the Bayesian stuff, integration stuff, and uh, I. This is, so I will introduce something very, very simple. And every first year student will learn it's about the, the one-way classification analysis variance. Let's say, suppose, just think about a simple example. Suppose we have a, a bunch of cars, let's like, say six of them. Okay, so, suppose we have six cars in, in our hand, then so, so, some car, uh, car rental dealer finds six cars, and then he may sort of do some road tests on each of the car, uh, say, uh, a few times. Okay, in the example we have is, uh, we say, each to five times, but sometimes you may, some car you may test it for 10 times, other car you may test it for one or two times or two or three times. So anyway, so that's a one-way classification. Suppose you, your, your main interest is on the means of uh, the, the five or six cars you have. So then you, you can just write a model like we have. Oh, 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 let me How that? Good. Oh, this. Oh, most. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. You still have to see. Okay, I will just by, by saying that, you just see the last equation, the yij equals to say that i plus eij. And the say that i definitely is the mean, right? And the eij is just the random fluctuation of the cars, okay, of the, of the cars. So I just say eij is a random noise with a common variance, sigma one square. Suppose, so. If that's the case, then we can make inference about the car, linear function of the car under the, suppose we say, okay, that this car have nothing to do with each other, have very little to do with each other, uh, are roughly independent, its feature is roughly independent, and, uh, but we're interested in the five cars. Then that's the famous one-way classification, uh, estimating, uh, uh, basically testing the, the, the commonality the equality of the means. So that's one way. Here you have, a, in the Bayesian context in the early days, you would just use this locally uniform prior, and, uh, and the, the, that's a, a system followed by Jeffries, uh, uh, suggested in the 30s and 40s, and uh, it's based on the, the so-called non-informative prior that I think Box and I started to use, it, use that term, and basically, we have, we have did spend a lot of time in the book just trying to just the, to justify that. And then at that time in the 60s, uh, 70s, is it, it, is used by a lot of people on that one. And uh, so that in that case, we we have a local uniform prior for each. We, we say all the five cars are, has nothing to do with well, their features are independent of each other. And uh, well, local uniform prior. That's the prior we get. And in that one, in, uh, in terms of the classical theory, the, the results is numerically all very equivalent to the, uh, uh, the posterior distribution. I mean, the, 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 the one-way classification, you know, testing for equality of the mean and so forth. So, so that's one way you can do. That's what we call this model, fixed effect model. Now, but on the other hand, at that time, 
there was a competing model in the book, which is actually quite important in the, to think about the treat the car as a random sample from a population. For example, the five cars are all, all made by Toyota or, or Honda or something like that. Now, then, now, but of course, car to car still have a difference, could have a difference. So we can use the, each car in the theta i equals the uh, overall mean of all the Toyota cars plus the EI, which is sort of like the, the quality difference between you know, I's cars and J's cars and so on. So, the, so, so that's the situation. And uh, so I will have, between car to car, we have another variance. Okay. They're, they're from a population, another variance, well, it's called a sigma two square. So this uh, leads to what is called the variance uh, uh, component model. And uh, we spend in the, that model I started with uh, Professor Tang, who also now retired now. And uh, in his thesis in Wisconsin, he talk about analyze the, analyze the variance, uh, uh, the variance component. The variance component are uh, not very well taught in usual statistical tests. But if you go to industry, this variance component might become very, very important. Because they say, well, you know, our process under all kinds of different kinds of uh, uh, noise. Each noise has a different variance. That becomes a variance component problem. But the, the variance component problem does have some, quite a few problems which you don't have time to talk about. But still, we can make inference on that. And uh, so, uh, but Box and I did something different, which I'll talk about in the next way. This is sort of, well, you can still think about the six cars that you have as from a car population. And then maybe you say, you make a convenience, make an uh, uh, assumption that um, they are from the same population, and, but they have a different variance, we call sigma two square. And then here's the difference. But in that case, you can still make a sort of a inference about the original six means, which is sort of given in the, the next, the lower part of the plot, the, and the green dots. That's sort of like each you have a, like a t, t distribution and so forth. And then the top part is the when you assume the six car are from the po car population, for this simple example. Then you can see, then you have the posterior mean given by the black dots. Huh. I hope you can see that. And then if I connect the black dots with the green cars, car by car, you see what? The red, the, the green car, the green dots are more spread out, or the black dots is sort of more, uh, and more custom, slightly more custom together. Now, this is a, a, a phenomenon and that in the 60s became very, very important at that time. Some of you probably aware at the time that Charles Stein had a paper talking about uh, the, the least square estimator, the sample mean, which everybody used is inadmissible. That was sort of the shrinkage thing came out. That was regarded as a sort of basic revolution of classical statistics at the time. And uh, but from the basic point of view, as Lindley is the first one to point out, that assuming that the cars are from a car population, and then we have the, 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 the top curve, and the top six black dots, which are kind of um, more clustered together. And then we call that the shrinkage phenomenon. And then in the 60s, the shrinkage is, is a very, very important hot topic. And then you can find a basic point, you can easily do that. Now, the next thing is, I think it's quite useful. Why you have that together is that if you make an inference, work out the distribution, posterior distribution of the, uh, to estimate each individual, say that, and then that's posterior mean is what? It's, a, it's, it's of this linear function of the, the, the y, I dot means the i's cars average, okay? And then y with two dot is the overall average. So you can see this posterior mean <coughs> is a linear function of two things, interpolation of what? The, the, uh, uh, 
them ask me, and then want the Grammy. But where does the Grammy come up? That's all from the individual means. So in other words, if you use a fixed effect, your mean is uh, the green dot is just the eye dots. But the, the black dot is what? It's the interpolation between eye dots and the white dot. So essentially what you're doing is this, is under the assumption that the sample is from a population, then that allows you to borrow information from other car to your car. That is the key thing about the uh, shrinkage effects, the shrinkage, so-called shrinkage phenomenon. And uh, this is a paper that uh, my teacher and I published in, in the, in the uh, 1978, okay, in 1978, uh, in, in, in Jessa, okay. And uh, it's, it's very, very simple and we put it in the book, but it does have an interesting sort of effect that the base allows you, by assuming the cars are from a population, the basing approach allows you to use other cars' information on your car. In other words, you can uh, allow you to use information from other people on your side because you assume they have a common distribution. So that is the point I want to emphasize. At that time, I think, well, uh, the paper in 68 is probably the first paper clearly sort of made clear about, about this effect. So here I summarize it again. It's a, the, the difference between six effect versus random effect model is a random effect model because you assume the car are from the same population. That's allowed you to uh, use information from other cars to estimate your car. The, that really is probably the only key point, the really key point. And now I want to do this about, uh, on some other examples. I said, uh, here I have a little bit of complaint, and the, then the 60, we cannot integrate. I spent a, a good deal of my time on that, but that solved, problem solved after I left the Bayesian field, basically. And, um, and then, so then that, that MCMC more or less kind of revolutionized statistics, revolutionized uh, sort of computation statistics, and make statistics the so-called sexiest subject. Before that, every school would say statistics is something on the periphery. Okay, in the business, especially many years in the business school, it treated as a, as on the periphery. You, you, you're okay to, have, to be there, but you're okay to be, to disappear. But now people don't say that anymore. That's all because of MCMC. And uh, I think that's one of the key reasons that my friend Greg become so famous. Their book becomes so much famous. It's really very well known as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> sort of like a, more, for many years, like a deep book in marketing data analysis. And congratulations, Greg. And glad to see that. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, but not only that, but also in other areas as well. So, so that's the situation. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about it, the, the shrinkage phenomenon. The how do you use other things? Oh, I still have, how much more time I have? You have probably about 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes. <clears throat> okay, so then I talk slowly, okay? And, but this is the key point, that you can borrow information from other car to your car. So i like to discuss two other interesting examples. <laughs> okay, the first example is the, uh, the famous books example. The book is by uh, three people, Rossi, uh, Greg, and my colleague. All three of them, my colleagues at, at, at Chicago, okay. And uh, Rossi, Alan B, and my colleague. Well, I think I don't have to say any more uh, because you're all familiar with, with them. Uh, before I go to the other two examples, one other thing you can think about is this. The, the, the Bayesian approach is good because you allow you to use by saying that they are sorry, have a distribution and then you can borrow information. There's another interesting thing about this. And if you look at this very clear, 
If you say have five thousand customers, five thousand customers, or or, or fifty thousand customers, how many parameters do you have? By allowing they have a distribution, you only say, for example, normal distribution or some other distribution, then you can what? You only have to estimate how many parameters. Two. And then think about your, say that I, is a random draw from that distribution. So you think about the dimension reduction. It's, it's, it's in, this is for me, when I talk here, talk to, here people talk about high dimensional data, I always laugh. I say, why well, you make a distribution assumption? Then immediately, this is the, the, the simplest dimension reduction tech, and this, if it's reasonable, which I'll I talk a little about. So you can see the Bayesian found this, this is saying, you have three things. The shrinkage, you see that, and the, which I'll show you some more. And then the second thing is the efficient use of data information. That uh, you can actually prove in your estimate of, of the individual car, and the, your estimate will have better properties. And the third thing is the dimension reduction. So just, uh, just hope. Uh, uh, I have convinced you this is dimension reduction nowadays become sort of the most important uh, reason for uh, looking at the problem this way. All right. So now perhaps I can go to the two examples. One is the example in uh, uh, Rossi Allen Beam. I call it, I just call it RAM, right? Okay. The 205. And they have a famous cheese example, which I known that for a while, and reason we really look into this. And Greg can correct me if I said anything wrong with this, okay? And uh, because you basically have 88 stores, each has about 65 to 68 data points. So you have a panel of 88 stores. This is their sort of consumption of, of, of cheese. And uh, there are 60 some weeks, and so you basically have some of the problems are interesting. One is the intercept, another one is the, the pricing log. Uh, that of course, is the sales depend upon the most important thing. Always, uh, I, this, this is all the thing I know about marketing. It's always what? Price, display, and discount. You're in. You're, you're <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I should be admitted to the marketing science. <laughs> Price, discount, and uh, Price, display, and feature ad, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. So, so you have that. So therefore, you can have a panel of 88 regressions, right? You may, they may or may not, with local volume, each has 65 points, and the price and display the regressor. And then the error term for each of the uh, 88 regressions they may or may not, they probably should be, have nothing to do, we we'll can assume that to be nothing to do with each other, but necessarily have the same variability. So you just, you have ADA regression, each has three or, three or four parameters, and that's it. And uh, so, so what I'm going to do later on in a minute is to uh, uh, look at the histogram. For each of the regression coefficient, if each of the regression intercept or price or 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 the discount of price or or the display, they all from a normal distribution. I'll show you the result of that. And by assuming these are all from some distribution, like a normal distribution with a with a mean and some variance and so on. Okay, so that's. Then uh, I'll mark them in a minute. I'll mark them to, to see the difference of the three. I'll mark them, say, okay, the blue one is the least square. That's roughly corresponds to just a fixed effect analysis. Okay. And, uh, and then the red is, uh, is uh, in, the, in RAM or in, in their program calculated that. And then also I add another thing since, uh, since I'm all most familiar with locally uniform, uh, the uninformative product. I also use the informative product. But before I show you for the result of the RAM example, I'd like to
talk a few minutes about another example. This is other example. Uh, Professor Chang uh, Duang gave it to me. I said, if I go to Sunday in Japan, I better use a Japanese example. It would be better. Or, oh, then she, she said, okay, she got one. This is the scanner data. That data is found this, uh, this center, DSSR, in your university, and gave him the data. Oh, oh the data is really a, a Tokyo data. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Hongwei, you, you correct me if I say anything wrong, right? <laughs> What's DSSR? <coughs> it's, a, this, uh, it's a center for what? What's a DSSR? Oh, That's your center, right? <laughs> okay. So this is your data, your center, all right? And it roughly has the purchase behavior of more than 1,600 households for a convenience store in a period of about 66 months. And there are many things I can do with that. And then I have detailed information about the attributes of household and promotion stuff and all that. But for my uh, talk today, I just focus on the effect again, just like the, the RAM example, the effect on total monthly spending with respect to discount, display, and feature advertising. And, and then, similar to the previous example, we use a log of the monthly total spending as a dependent variable, and then we say interceptor, and then and a term for discount, a term for display, a term for, for, uh, for um, a, a term for discount, display, and feature. Okay, so now I'll show you the next few plots, okay? Now, the first one is the RAM data. Okay. The RAM data on the extreme left is the blue. The blue is the least square, which is roughly like you do the ADA regression, and each has a, has a least square coefficient. And that, that's what it is. Okay? And then in the middle is the what? Uh, the RAM, uh, see. And that's using and Greg's program, and so forth. And then, the, finally, the blue is using the, uh, 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 the, the non-informative pride. And that's something I spent a lot of time on that. So I said, well, for just for, <laughs> for the sake of completeness, I'd like to see how that's different from the previous example. From, from the, the non-informative pride and Greg's pride, well, first of all, you compare with the uh, the green one. The the thing that you notice most is what on the red and the green. They are more concentrated. In other words, they are shrinkage. Okay, but it seems that the 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 blue the the red one is probably shrinking a little more than the than the blue. Okay. And this is quite, but this is intercept. Now, you come to the display. Well, the display, again, the blue is what? The, the least square. And then the red and the green, you can see, obviously, the red one shrink more. Shrink more. And the non-informative product shrink sort of a, a little differently. Okay, so that's one thing. But then, if you go to the, oh, here's a, another plot. This is a log price. Again, you see more or less the same situation. Okay, the red one shrink a little more to, than the green one, and the, but both of them shrink somewhat from the from the, uh, the, the from the blue one. Now, the next plot, I sort of put them together. You can just see very clearly each figure is the same. The intercept, the display, and log prices, you put it together, you can just see the shrinkage of the green is not as, as, as high as the, uh, as the red. Okay, so that's for this. Now, for the second example, the, uh, the Japan scanner data, you have similar situation. And 
there are four coefficients. The extreme left is the intercept, and then there's the discount, and then there's the display, and then there's the feature head. In both, in all these cases, you'll find the shrinkage, but depend upon the, uh, the, the coefficient, and the, the red seems to shrink more than the, than the green. They put them together. Okay. So that's what, so the scanner data versus the, the uh, RAM data, the same way. So now I can sort of finally comment in a little bit on the, this whole three examples. You see, both of this example, you can think about this as a panel data, right? A panel data, which is sort of a, have limited information on each one, and uh, the goal is to try to pull the information together to achieve useful purposes, to make inference. And the Bayesian random effect model, I show you the original simple car example, and then the more clearly the RAM example and the scanner data together. The Bayesian random effect model provides the most natural and useful way setting for this goal, to use information. And uh, I remember that was a joke from my former colleagues some time ago. And once I visited them, talking about this, he said the distribution is very nice because the distribution says what? All the things are alike, but not exactly alike. So, it's, so if it's alike, so you can distinguish between men and dogs, okay? But among men, <laughs> there, are, there are differences. So you give them a distribution. Instead of like the fixed effects thing, you say it's just different me. It has nothing to do with each other. That's in, in how to, to, to do. That's how to, to, to take. So the shrinkage is how the information from different sources and from different individuals can be pulled together to estimate. So, so that's the nice thing about the shrinkage. However, when you say enough nice things, there are also some differences. You can see the, the prior from the, from the red and the, the non-informative prior. One is shown by the red, one is shown by the green, are not exactly the same. They all shrink, but shrink differently. There's one other thing you notice this. You can see sh the shrinking red you know, on the long tail, you can see that on the right hand side. The long tail is clear in the blue, but it's what? Disappear from the what? Green and the red. In green, you have a, a little bit more than the red. It completely disappear. So it's sometimes you work when you do state analysis. It's a good thing to borrow information each other. On the other hand, you don't want to shrink out all the Bill Gates and so forth. You see what I mean? You have a distribution. In other words, all the data we have, most of the time, they're always outliers. So I'm mentioning this, this business. The more I think about it, the more I think the outlier is really important part of our analysis. And that, well, of course, the outlier could be just bad observation. On the other hand, it could be a very important discovery for you. So one advice I would like to give it to people here and so on, and it's also I do that all the time in my, in my own teaching, is that you always pay a lot of attention to our lives. Because our lives allow you to, to what? To discover the unexpected. The unexpected could be very, very important for you. Could be the thing that gave makes you get Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my last comment is that we need the prior is sensitive. The how how to choose the prior is still a very important important point. I have some idea but I don't have time to talk about it. And uh, how to choose a prior. Prior is different. Make difference. That's important. As you can see the RAMS prior 
and that the local non-informant are not quite the same. But the more important issue is shrink is a very nice phenomenon. On the other hand, I do worry about just shrinking away all the outliers and so forth that may, uh, may be doing too much. How do you strike a balance between the shrinkage and the outlier detection? I think it's one of the very important statistical issues uh, that's still facing us. Well, I'm a, I, sh I think I should really shut up. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to read around that, uh, uh, 